Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Brandon, uh, serving alongside Pastor Kale. Uh, glad that you're here worshiping the Lord with us today. I encourage you to take a moment during the first part of the service to fill out your attendance card. They're located in the pew in front of you. There's a white card if you're a member, a gold if you're visiting here with us. Uh, and those will be collected by our ushers uh, as they return back from bringing forward the offering later on in the service. Uh, we're glad you're here uh, to worship the Lord with us. I'd invite you as you're able to please rise for opening song. Forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Facing love, how can it be? That you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. In all I do, I honor you. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? That you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. And all I do, I honor you. You. you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. And all I do, I honor you. In the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our uh, epistle reading for today talks about the rest that God uh, invites us into. And so at the beginning of the service, so we'll reflect a little bit uh, on how uh, God has given us uh, that rest in Jesus Christ. When the children of Israel lived in Egypt and were slaves, God sent ten plagues upon Egypt to set his people free and give them rest. When the children of Israel had their backs to the Red Sea, they saw God part the Red Sea, and they walked across on dry ground as he gave them rest from their enemy. When there was no way out for us because of our sin, God sent his Son to the cross that all who believe would have eternal life and rest in that hope. We rest in that hope as we bring to our God our sin, our shortcomings, our failures, our brokenness, and receive his rest, his forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We take a moment for reflection on God's word. Most merciful, or let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, 
We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence in eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God hears our cry. He, he meets us where we're at, wherever we have wandered. He meets us there to give us his true rest. That Jesus Christ took on your sin and mine on the cross, and he paid the price fully. And it's a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, please be seated for our uh, baptism. I, I invite you to turn in, in the hymnal in the pew in front of you uh, to page 268 uh, for the order of holy baptism. All right, guys, come on up. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The Word of God teaches that we are conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all grace and mercy has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And those are the blessings uh, that, that are yours in baptism uh, today. So I ask you, how is he to be named? Owen. Owen, receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon your forehead and upon your heart. To mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. We pray. Lord God, throughout history, you have used water uh, both to remove sin and to rescue your people. Uh, you you uh, destroyed Pharaoh and his army in the waters of the Red Sea, and you rescued your people on dry land. Uh, you punished sin uh, through the flood, but you rescued Noah and his family through the ark. And so here in the waters of baptism, it's exactly what you promised is going to happen for Owen. That you will wash away all of his sins. And not only that, that you will rescue him, you will bring him into your family, putting your very name on him, that these promises will endure forever. So we thank and praise you for this miracle of water and the word. We ask that you would continue to bless and keep us in those same promises. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. We continue now on page 270 by praying the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And oh, and the Lord preserve your coming out and your going in, this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Uh, we'll continue by uh, kind of confessing the faith in which you're being baptized. So I ask uh, you guys to uh, answer these questions uh, together. Owen, oh, do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce him. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Yes, I do. And Owen, do you desire to be baptized? Yes, I do. All right, buddy. All right, if you kind of lean over as best you can. Owen, Michael Bassett, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O oh, and the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you this new birth of water and the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. All right, I'm going to meet you guys over up front, and I'll get your baptismal candle ready. Hold it, you hold it right on the bottom like that. Perfect, there we go. Awesome. Owen, receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ. Be ever watchful for his coming. That you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which shall have no end. Congregation, I turn your attention to page 271 as we welcome Owen into the family of God. In holy baptism, oh, and God has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven and the one holy Christian and apostolic church. So we receive you in Jesus' name as our brother in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Together we say, Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Owen the new birth and holy baptism, made him a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Owen, God's peace be with you. Amen. I'll take this and uh, I'll pa pack it up for you to take with you. Pass this out to you, buddy. Here's uh, your baptismal certificate and your, your candle. And how about I introduce you to the newest member of the family of God? <laughs> we'll continue with our next song. filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shine among us his glory revealed he loved me Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day he him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him 
to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he the hand that held nations stood out on a tree and took the nails for me living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now as ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him from rising again living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day oh glorious day Day, the trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day oh glorious day oh glorious day Lord, your divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. So put away from us all things hurtful and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue this morning with our readings, and our first reading, our Old Testament reading, comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. It says this, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his herd, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from the mother, his mother's womb, so shall he go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away with his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, I have seen to be good and fitting. What I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. 
for he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forgiveness is in you. Defeated into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose. Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in the life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. 
For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our sermon text is our gospel reading from Mark chapter 10. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. For many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, So I want to talk a little bit uh, this morning. I want us us to think about uh, this thing right here. Now if you're not eagle-eyed and can't tell, there's a, I'll give you a few hints. There's an N- S, an E, and a W on the corners of it, or as how I learned it growing up, never eat soggy waffles. It's it's a compass, right? It tells us the directions of of, uh, kind of where where we're headed, where we're going. And I learned about this in school, and I thought, I'm going to use a compass all the time. And then I never needed one. (laughs) That is until I went uh, to college in Nebraska. See, I grew up in St. Louis, and uh, kind of a city boy, and the way we gave directions where I was from is, all right, you're going to go a couple blocks down, you're going to see a Walgreens, turn right at the Walgreens. If you get uh, to the CVS, which is across the street, because somehow they're always across the street from one another, uh, you've gone too far, and you need to turn around and, and, and go back. That's how I learned how to drive. That's how I learned how to, how to navigate. And then I get to college in Nebraska, and I'm getting directions somewhere, and the guy tells me, you're going to go about a mile down the road, mile, mile and a half, something like that, and then you're going to turn north. And I have no idea what that means or how I'm supposed to figure that out other than looking at the sun, and I know there's something in there, but I go, how do people just know what direction north uh, is as they go through? Because I grew up with turn left or turn right. Turns out a compass may not be the worst idea after all. And now what a compass doesn't do, a GPS tells you what your destination is and it gets you there. A compass doesn't do that. It doesn't tell you where you're going. It simply tells you, are you on the right track? Are you heading in the right direction? And in the context of us being at a church this morning, we kind of know the answer. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, my, my destination, it, the answer's got to be Jesus, right? I mean, he's the way, the truth, and the life. But the question for us is, am I heading in the right direction? What, what's my compass? My direction is, is heaven, if that's where I want to head, am I heading in the right direction? Direction And how do I know that? For the people in Mark chapter 10, they had a couple different 
uh, compasses that they use to tell, is someone blessed by God? Are they doing the right thing? Are they heading in the right direction? The, the main one was, do I, do I want to know, am I going the right way? Well, look at the stuff that I have. What has God given to me? God has blessed me if, if I'm wealthy. That's clearly a sign that he is, is pleased with me. And so at that time, when this young man came to Jesus, which was our reading for last week, happened right before our text for today, this young man who is very wealthy comes to Jesus and asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Most of the people around would go, buddy, you're already on the right track. Clearly, you're doing the right things because look at all the ways God has blessed you. Look at how wealthy that you are. But that's not what Jesus tells him. No, Jesus says, go, sell everything that you have. And then come follow me. See, our, our material blessings, our wealth, it's not the compass that, that lets us know, are we on the right track or not? Jesus doesn't seem to care about that at all when it comes to the kingdom of God. And so Peter gives us a different answer in Mark chapter 10. He tells Jesus, he goes, see, we have left everything behind to come follow you. Maybe if the compass isn't wealth, maybe it's works. God, look at what I've done for you. I mean, I'm in a church on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of other things I could be doing. Doesn't doesn't that count for something? Look at what I've given up. Look at the things that I could have done, but I chose not to. Lord, look at my works. Haven't I done enough? And yet Jesus' answer to Peter, he, he rebukes Peter. He says, there's not a single person, there's no one that, that has given up all these things that won't be returned a hundredfold in life now. He's talking about the church, by the way. As well as eternal life in the life to come. The paraphrase here, the message to Peter is, Peter, your works are nothing special. They're not any different than anyone else that has followed me. The compass, the way to know am I on the right track, isn't to look at my, my wealth, my possessions. It isn't to look at my works, my achievements. In, in our world, I think we add another compass, another option to this list. We add a, a Happiness. How do I know if I'm on on the right track? Am I happy? Because God is most concerned with my happiness. That's that's the the number one thing he wants. God just wants me to be happy. And so if I'm doing something, uh, if I'm in in relationship with someone, if I'm pursuing something that makes me happy, God must be all right with it. And and this is kind of the compass that we use uh, in, in our life. Right, to, to seek after uh, whatever it is that makes us happy, not realizing that that's changing all the time. And the, the problem with, is that wealth comes and goes. Our works are sometimes good, oftentimes not. Our, our hearts consistently change, and so we find ourselves wandering around, not sure exactly which direction we're going. The main benefit of a compass is it has a true north, it will be consistent in telling you here's where north is and you're meant to orient your direction, your life around that fixed point. But the truth is for most of us, we don't have that fixed point that anchors us. Our compass, rather than having a true north, it is more like the compass from Pirates of the Caribbean. If you remember that movie about 20 years ago, a Captain Jack Sparrow had a compass that he, he gets made fun of because it doesn't point north. You know, what use do you have with a compass that doesn't point north? As the story unfolds, we find out the compass isn't broken. But instead of pointing north, it points to whatever your heart wants most. And that seems an awful lot like what tends to drive us on a regular basis. 
Rather than a true north, a fixed point that I orient my life around, it's what do I want most? And I find my life just kind of leaning in that direction. We live in a world where, where the current is, is kind of sweeping in one direction, and without even noticing it, it's very easy for us to, to simply drift along with the ways of the world. I had a friend uh, who grew up in Chicago, and so he grew up uh, supporting a baseball team. You might have heard of them, the Chicago Cubs. I don't know too much about them, but I'm pretty sure they eventually grow up and become the Bears, and they play football. Like That's kind of the progression of how it works. So, but he grew up a diehard Chicago Cubs fan. And he became a teacher and a principal and received a divine call to teach at a, a school in St. Louis. I already said I'm from St. Louis, and, and uh, God has blessed us with a team called the St. Louis Cardinals. And regardless of which side you fall on this, all of us kind of know there's a rivalry between these two teams. And so what did my friend swear up and down to all his friends and family in Chicago? Hey, I'm taking the, this teaching position in St. Louis, but don't worry, I am not going to become a Cardinals fan. So he gets to St. Louis and that continues to do kind of things that he did uh, when he was in Chicago. He reads the newspaper. Now, St. Louis doesn't really get the Chicago Tribune, so he starts reading the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And funnily enough, the Post-Dispatch doesn't really write a lot about the Cubs. They write a whole lot about the Cardinals. And he continues to listen to sports talk radio, and he's listening to the local stations here in St. Louis, and not too much talk about the Cubs a whole lot, day in and day out, about the Cardinals. And as he's in the teacher's lounge and talking to students, they're talking about what happened the day before in the baseball game. But it's not the Cubs game. They're talking about the Cardinals game. And a couple years go by, and my friend realizes, I can name every single player on the Cardinals roster. I know their stats. I know where they are in the standings. I don't even know who the manager is of the Cubs. And then here was his conclusion that he drew. I think I'm a Cardinals fan. Even though he had promised and swore up and down that was never going to happen. At no point did he intentionally say, hey, I'm switching my allegiances from this team to the other team. Instead, he was in an environment where the current, where the news, where everyone around him is going in one direction, and he finds himself simply being swept up in that. And it is so easy for that to happen in our world where there is a current that is, that is flowing away from the truth of God whether it's towards our wealth, whether it's towards our works, whether it's towards our own happiness. And it is so easy for us to get swept up in whatever it is. There's any number of options where without even realizing it, our compass has changed. And instead of having a, a point that we orient our life around, we end up just following whatever it is that our heart desires without realizing that our heart might be wrong. That, that our love actually might be, might be sinful. And in a world like this, it's easy for us to end up asking the same questions the disciples ask in Mark 10. Well, who then can be saved? Hey, the odds are clearly stacked against us. What hope do we have? And Jesus' answer to us is the same. That's what he told his disciples. With man, it is impossible. But not with God. With God, all things are possible. Because our God operates with a different compass. He doesn't look at you and I based on our works or our wealth or our happiness or whatever it is that we think we bring to the table. No, the compass of our God is love. 
not a self-centered, short-sighted, what have you done for me lately kind of a love that oftentimes orients our life. But an unconditional, sacrificial, never-ending love of a God towards his people, a God that always keeps his promises. So when Jesus looked at this, this rich young man who everyone else had judged based on his wealth, and that was the only thing that mattered to the people around him. Mark 10 tells us Jesus looked at this man and he loved him. And then he told him, go, sell all you have. Because Jesus didn't care about his wealth. Everyone else did. That's not what mattered to Jesus. He says, get rid of all of that when you have nothing left to offer, nothing to bring to the table. Still come follow me. And it's the same message for you and I. Jesus says, your, your, your wealth, your works, uh, your, your happiness, whatever you've done, whatever you're following, whatever you think earns the favor of your God, leave it all behind. Come follow me. Because it's not about what you bring to the table, it's about what God has done for you. It's about the love of God and Jesus Christ that took him to the cross. And it's the same thing, not just for the things we think earn God's favor, but, but for the things that we think remove us from God's favor. That There's no way God would co- possibly want a person like me. God says, bring that, whatever it is, bring it to the cross of Jesus Christ and leave it there. Get rid of it. In fact, his, his, his love, his grace does get rid of it for us as he fully forgives us. And then come and follow me. Say, how do I know I, I'm on the right path? How do I know I'm going the right direction? I look at the word of God, the promises that, that what, what he has done for me. And then in the waters of baptism, he washed away all my sins, brought me into his family, placed his very name on to me that that which does not change becomes my true north, becomes the very thing that I orient my life around. So instead of moving from one place to another, just following the current of the world, we instead have an anchor that we can come back to, a point that we can orient our life around each and every day. The truth of God's word, his love for us in Jesus Christ is our compass. But not only that, he also continually brings us back to that word, not just in these big moments, but in in the little moments where we're when we're straying a little bit from the path, God calls us back to Himself through these simple things. We live in a world where where the culture is is very clearly pulling us away in all these different directions, any other way, but living the truth of God's word. And the question is, how then can we remain steadfast? How can we endure in the midst of such trials? We recognize this is not the first time God's people have gone through this. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, one of the main uh, narratives that happens is, is God's people are taken out of Jerusalem, out of the land God has given them, and they're brought into exile in Babylon. And in Babylon, they're, they're surrounded uh, with people that are worshiping different gods, w- with rulers that, that have no care uh, for the God of the Israelites. They, they live in a culture that has totally different values. And it's about power rather than about faith. And as they get taken off into exile, what happens to the vast majority of God's people is they get swept up in the current without realizing it without intentionally doing anything, to the point where when the emperor, uh, when the leader, when King Nebuchadnezzar says, you must bow down and worship me, everyone does it. Everyone except four young men, Daniel, 
and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and it's remarkable to look at these young men and go, what, 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 what happened? It's a miracle that they remained faithful when everyone else had kind of gotten swept up, had, had removed the compass of God's word for any number of the options in the world. But what's more remarkable than just that one moment of faith, of standing up for the truth of God's word in the midst of certain death, what's more remarkable is the years leading up to those moments where Daniel and his friends, on a daily basis, they pray to their God. They gather together to encourage one another. They do the simple habits of the faith. And what those do on a daily basis is that keeps them back in line rather than than, than wandering over the course of days and months and years. Every day they're called back to the path that God has placed them on. And it's the same thing for you and and for me. As we're in a world where there's there's all these different occurrence, all these different ways that, that we can get swept up in, God gives us these simple habits These simple gifts that that regularly call us back to put our lives on the truth of his word. When when it's easy for us to get kind of swept up and and to caught up uh, in in the idea that church isn't really for me. I I don't really fit here. The, The simple habit of weekly worship where every week we come before our God, we confess our sins together and we receive the gift of forgiveness, the, the promise of God that all of that is forgiven. That keeps us back on, on the path, knowing that my sins are forgiven, that I am a child of God, that I belong, not because of anything that I've done, because of what God has done for me. When we, we begin to wonder, well, did God really say this? Does the Bible really say this? Does this really fit? The, the simple habit of, of Bible study, gather with other believers to encourage, to, to correct, to dive into the Scriptures together, it keeps us in the Word, keeps us on the right path, getting rid of those ideas that are not of the Lord. In a world where it's really easy to get swept up in focusing our whole life on money and wealth and security, God gifts us with the simple habit of what the Old Testament calls tithing or first fruits of giving first to the Lord, what the New Testament calls generosity and proportional giving, giving in light of what God has done for you, to do that first. Because what what that does, when we regularly are responding to God's goodness, what that reminds us week in and week out is this stuff isn't mine. It's not about me. It all belongs to God. So Lord, how can I be faithful with what you've given us? See, not only do our, our tithes and our offerings, yes, that's what funds the ministry of God's church to be the light to the world, but also it changes our hearts, the hearts of the giver, to keep us in line that our stuff would just be stuff, that ultimately we'd realize it, it belongs to God. And the simple habit, week in and week out, reorients our heart and our life in light of his truth and his grace. And in a world where it's so easy to make life all about me, God gives us the gift of service, of caring for our family and our church and our community in these simple ways which remind us life is about sharing the love of Jesus Christ, about giving, not just receiving. And each of these simple habits, they keep us rooted and grounded. They remind us of, of the true north, the direction we're headed in Jesus Christ. And that's what held Daniel and his friends in the midst of, of an increasingly hostile culture. And it's the same gift for you and I today. But may we always remember, we don't look at those habits, those works, for confidence in how we stand before God. No, instead we look to God's word always as our our compass, always as our guide in life. Where we go, I know where I stand, I know where I'm going, not because of what I'm doing, but because of what God has done for me in Jesus Christ. In his name, amen.
And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. Amen. Our service continues with a gathering of our offerings and I invite our children to join me out front for our children's message. All right, guys, come on up. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. All right, if you've got offering, you can place it in the basket. Okay. So, I showed this at the beginning of, of the sermon. We talked just a little bit about it, but anyone know what, what this, this is? Yeah. It's a compass. Yeah, yeah. And, and so a compass gives us direction, kind of lets us know, are we on the right track? But what I want us to think about a little bit is rather than, than kind of the direction of the compass, I want us to think of, of these different points. We have north, south, east, and west. So I want you to do, t- take your hands and kind of put them north on, on, on your body, on your head, north. Now I want you to move your hands south. All right, north, south, north, south, okay? Now go east to west. All right, now from the beginning. All right, north, south. East to west. What, what shape are we making when we do that? Yeah. A cross. Right? And, and I don't know if you've noticed, sometimes that, that happens in, in church here. And it's not people that are confused as to what to do with their hands. Or they, we, we sometimes do this intentionally. Right? North, south, east, west. Make the sign of the cross. We do it at the beginning of the service. And, and what that reminds us is, remember in, in baptism, we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it reminds us, at the beginning of the service, what are the words we say? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we make the sign of the cross reminding us we come into worship as God's children. That you belong here. That God's so glad that you're here. We make that sign, north, south, east, west, sign of the cross, after absolution, where we hear that we are forgiven, our sins are washed away. And the last time that we... Uh, kind of do that oftentimes, is at the very end of the service. You know, at the, the benediction, we'll do that uh, here in just a few minutes, where we're sent forward with God's blessing. And sometimes we make that sign of that cross, north, south, east, west. Because a- as we leave this place, wherever it is you're going next, are, are you still God's child when you walk out of these doors? Yeah, that's what it's meant to remind us, that wherever you go, whether it's the north or the south or the east or the west, You are God's child. He goes with you, uh, and his love is in you wherever it is that you go. All right, so let's take our hands and let's fold them. We'll say uh, some words of prayer. I'll I'll say them, and we'll repeat those back to God, all right? Dear God, thank you for bringing me into your family. Help me always to know that I am yours. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming up. You can head back to your seats, and uh, our ushers will bring forward our offerings. Heavenly Father, you give us all we need to support this body and life, and we pray that you would use these, our tithes and offerings, that your purposes might be accomplished, that others might hear the words of the gospel and come to faith in Christ, and that we also might be strengthened in our faith. All this we pray in his holy name. Amen.
In our prayers this morning, a couple petitions to add, two really cool prayers of celebration. First, 58th anniversary for Bob and Carol Booth. They're celebrating that this upcoming Tuesday, so we thank God for that. And then also a uh, prayer celebration for the birth of Walker Hansen Knobloch to Zach and Lauren Knobloch, uh, born on the 14th of this month. Grandparents are Brenda and David Knobloch. Uh, so we we'll thank God for, for Walker's birth and pray that he's brought quickly to the waters of baptism. We want to pray also for Dolly Meineker. Dolly Meineker is uh, hospitalized now with health concerns. And finally, uh, the family and friends of Virginia Heron. Virginia is a former member of Zion, uh, Mary Heron's cousin, and uh, passed away uh, this past week, was given Christian burial this past week. As you're able, please rise. Lord, you are near to the brokenhearted, and you save the crushed in spirit. Deliver us from every fear and trouble, and that, and that the praise of your name would continually be in our mouths. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, spare the servants of your church from the love of wealth and fear of the difficulty of their task, that they would gladly set aside every comfort for your sake and for the sake of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, lead our households to find eternal rest in your Son and his word. Give fathers and mothers diligence in teaching their children and preserve us all from hardness of heart. Give us urgency to hear the good message of salvation today. Be with all the families of this congregation, Lord. We remember especially this day, Mike Metzler and family, John and Linda Muir, Geraldine Meyer, Holly Meyer, Reuben Meyer, Terry and Nancy Meyer, Pastor Willie and Stephanie Meyer, Mark and Leanne Miller, David Miller, and Kevin Miller. We thank you also, Lord, for the birth of Walker Knobloch and the 58 years of marriage that you've granted to Bob and Carol Booz. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, guide our nation and its leaders to the true wisdom to promote honest labor, temporal protection, fitting enjo and fitting enjoyment under the sun. Guide your people to serve Christ in their citizenship and their callings. Do not let our hearts be occupied with the vanity of riches that perish, but with the true joy of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. When the righteous cry, you hear, O Lord, and you deliver them out of all their troubles. Draw near and save the brokenhearted, the crushed in spirit, the sick, the grieving, and those in need. Remember especially today, Dolly Meininger, Alice Gunderson, uh, Linda Muir, and all those who she served on the mission trip this last week. Ben Scott, Amy Meyer, Susan Seidner, Shirley Von Barron, Ann Walkington, Ruth Ann Keefe, Lucy Hale, Renee Valerie, Anna Mae Shanepalm, Pat Benefil, Becky and George Smith, Carol Booz, Danny Wiesman, the family and friends of Virginia Heron, Rex Gould, Lynn, Lynn Bertels, Tom Quinn, Christopher Wiesman, Julie, uh, Russell Butcher, Sandy Fix, Hudson Renegal, Carol Hunsdorfer, Steve O'Dell, Emerson Warner, Gail Peck, Nora Craddock, uh, Micah Fromer, Jane, Gordon Morton, Josh Hedges, Ed Geertz, Don La Donna Laster, Dave Robertson, Todd Kelly, Randy Lambert, Alex Bradshaw, Abram Smith, Daryl Johnson, Bob DeWerf, Al Bolin, Larry Lovejoy, Gary McDonough, Carla Klaustermeyer, Jim Hubner, Richard Dupotz, Carl Monaco, Robert Rombach, Dale Jones, Sheila Williams, Dan Shanehair, all those affected by the hurricanes and all those who go down to serve and meet the needs of their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your son has left his earthly home to, had left his earthly home to do his saving work, and so he knows what it is to leave family behind. Comfort your children who have left home and loved ones for the sake of the gospel. Set them firmly into the family of the church and sustain them in the hope of eternal life in the age to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Depart now with the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now, how great, how awesome is he, and together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth 
is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. And it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's Rena rising up all around it's the anthem of the Lord's Rena and together we sing everyone sing holy is the Lord God Almighty the earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. Thanks again for joining us for worship. We pray the service will be a blessing to you as we're set forth to be a blessing to others this week. A couple of things that we have coming up uh, here at Zion. Uh, you notice in the ministry center on the way out, there's a, uh, it's a, a, a set of wooden bunk beds with a net in it. Uh, that is uh, kind of our collection spot. Uh, our youth group is going to be serving at Sleep in Heavenly Peace uh, here late, later on in November. Uh, that is an organization that provides beds for children in our area uh, that, that are in need of that. Uh, and so if you want to send our youth group with some uh, new supplies uh, to, to go along with those beds that they'll be helping create, uh, there's a whole list of kind of new items uh, that can be put in that uh, over the next couple weeks. Uh, this Friday is our trunk or treat, 6 o'clock to 7.30 uh, that the trunks will be set up uh, kind of on this side. Uh, the line will kind of go out that way. Uh, and so we're excited uh, to be able to kind of interact with our community in that way. There's still a number of ways to get involved, bring candy, volunteer, that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but the thing I want to encourage, uh, especially uh, today, is think about who you can, can invite, whether it's a family member, a neighbor, someone that might not know about it, uh, because it is one of the easiest, kind of most uh, non-confrontational invites to a church ever. Come to our parking lot, we'll give you candy. That's, that's the, uh, you know, try to be super inviting uh, for that. So uh, if you have someone that you can think of to reach out to about that, I really encourage each of us to think, who has God placed in my life that I can connect with in this way? Uh, we have our stewardship forms. We talked about these uh, last week. Uh, they're located on the white table as you head out. Uh, and uh, those can be picked up uh, today and dropped off any time during the month. Uh, one encouragement for that is uh, this provides opportunities, ways to serve, ways to get connected. And the good news, if you turn it back into us, uh, we will contact you about whatever it is. You don't have to go guessing, well, how do I do this or who's in charge of that? Uh, we'll kind of help facilitate that uh, for you. So I encourage you to take this, pray over it, and uh, bring it back uh, when you get a chance. Last uh, but not least, kind of our ministry win for this week is our church directory, which was last updated, pictorial directory, last updated over a decade ago. 
The new ones are in. Uh, it looks fantastic. Uh, and so if you ordered one of those uh, when you, you took your pictures for that, those are available. You can pick those up today. I have one that have, has a little note that has your name on it. If you, you're wondering if you missed out on that, you can still, we bought some extras. You can still purchase one of those uh, in the back. Uh, but excited for that project, all the hard work that went into that. Uh, look forward to getting those in your hands. Hopefully helps you learn names and faces of other people here at Zion. Thanks again for being here, and God's blessings to you this week.